Hi guys, I wanted to come on here and tell you about our upcoming fall semester. So for those of you who weren't able to make it to our Zoom call tonight, um, the theme of our semester is relationships. And I wanted to give a little talk on the foundation of relationships as Christians. Because apart from Christ, a talk on relationships is going to start with self. It's going to start with me. Um, but in Christ, as Christians, our approach to relationships should actually be radically different from the way that the world would approach relationships. Because as Christians, we believe that relationship starts with God. And I'm going to give three main points today for our lecture. And the three points are this. In relationships, the foundation is God. The purpose is the gospel, and the result is freedom. The foundation is God, not self. The purpose is the gospel, and the result is freedom. So let's dive right in. Um, apart from God, relationships start with man, right? So if I am the foundation of my relationship, if it starts with me, myself, and I, and then maybe moves on to relationship with other people, then if there's a problem, then the solution is me, is myself, or maybe the other person. Um, but the reason why our relationships get so messed up um, is not just because we haven't figured ourselves out well enough yet. It could be part of it. It's not just because we're socially awkward or I'm an introvert and she's an extrovert. That could play a part. But that's not the primary reason why relationships are messed up. The reason why we have difficulty in relationship starts with God and starts with our brokenness towards God. Our brokenness is because we are sinful human beings. The result of sin broke our relationship with God and that sin affects every single relationship that we're in. See, the problem in our relationships is not personality. It's total depravity. It's the fact that, as it says in Philippians 2, all seek their own interests and not the interests of Jesus Christ. Seeking our own interests <laughs> and our own interests alone and primarily and first and foremost, it actually leads to relational chaos and brokenness. But this is really good news because the beginning of a healthy relationship doesn't start with self. The beginning of a healthy relationship starts with God and starts with the gospel. So that's where we're gonna to start tonight. As Christians, we believe that there is a personal, relational God who made us. And that relational God, he, we sin against him. Eve in the Garden of Eden ate the apple and sinned. And what was the punishment for that sin? Death. Death was the punishment. And it destroyed the relationship with God, but it also destroyed the relationship with others. Think about the first two human beings who were born, Cain and Abel. What happened? Murder. Cain killed Abel. Death immediately. And even though that death was like literal physical dying, we see death all around us. In fact, when I think about relationships, oftentimes when a relationship is broken, when it's separated, it feels like a death. Whether it's because of conflict and that person no longer talks to you, whether it's because of a romantic friendship or relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend or girlfriend and boyfriend, or maybe it's just someone moving away. I know recently we moved away to Kentucky and it felt like death. It felt like a friendship had died, like a relationship had died because I no longer see that person. I no longer interact with them. And part of that death that, that, that we're feeling comes from the consequence of sin. And, and that sin towards God, we, we weren't just unaware. We were dead towards God. We didn't just need like greater knowledge and then we could fix this relationship with God or some, some enlightenment in our relationship. We needed new life. And here's the good news of the gospel. The solution is not to love yourself better the solution is not even necessarily to love your neighbor more. The solution is Jesus, 
who loved you more than you have ever loved yourself, who loved you more than anyone else has ever loved you. See, the problem in our relationship is sin. So the solution in our relationship is a savior. And that is very good news. Relationship that was broken at the tree in the Garden of Eden is relationship restored at the tree of Calvary. And one day will be made perfect when Jesus Christ comes back and returns as the conquering king. God took enemies and now calls them friend. He suffered to make us friends and to fix the relationship between God and man. And he forgave our sins and he gave us new life. And guess what? That new life also fixes the relationship between man and man. See, as women of Palm Vista, as whoever is watching this right now, any relationship that you're in, I mean, we all have very different beliefs, right? I mean, we have different personalities. We have different preferences from education to politics to how we spend our money and our time. Are you a morning person or a night owl? Are you a bookworm or are you a movie buff? I mean, do you put, do you put pineapple on your pizza? <laughs> like, these are all different things personalities, right? These are all beautiful and great. And we can see differently on these things. But as Christians, the one thing, the foundational truth that we stand on in life and in our relationships is God, is the gospel. And this God was perfect, came down to earth, died for his enemies and gave them new life. He made peace with us. Our relational security begins and ends with God. Relationships are important to the gospel because relationship is what was broken and relationship was restored by Jesus forgiving our sins. So point one, the foundation of our relationship is God. Bonhoeffer says it like this, Christian brotherhood is not an ideal which we must realize. It is rather a reality created by God in Christ, in which we get to participate. The more clearly we learn to recognize that the ground and strength and promise of all our fellowship is in Jesus Christ alone, the more serenely shall we think of our fellowship and pray for it and hope for it. So we're gonna open up and look at what Paul says about relationships in Philippians chapter 1, verse 1 through 11. Paul writes an incredibly personal letter of concern and love for the saints who are living in Philippi. And here's what I want you to hear. I want you to hear his heart. That relationship begins with God. He is our foundation. But that foundation doesn't end with God. It gives us a deeper connection to one another than anything else could ever, because the connection we have with God is divine and it's eternal. And our hope is through God, not through man. God is our foundation. So let's open up to Philippians chapter one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers and the elders. I love this. Verse one automatically is like, to all the saints. And just in case you were wondering, that also includes overseers, and deacons, like everyone, everyone. I am writing this letter to you all, my brothers in Christ. And this is what he says, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, our peace, our peace in relationships, our peace in life does not come from perfect friendships. It doesn't come from a perfect unity between man and man. It comes from a perfect unity in Christ. Peace does not come from us getting like really good at being the perfect friend or us never messing up or never being socially awkward. Our peace comes from God the Father and his perfect relationship with us and resting securely in him. Verse three says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy. Hear that deep passion and love and connection in every prayer with great joy for you all. And then verse five, 
because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. I, I think about what kind of partnerships I've been a part of that have really united me to other people. I think, you know, I'm a homeschool mom. So uh, other homeschool moms, there's like a partnership there. We're like, we're in this together. We're going to educate our kids. We're going to figure this out. We have this one goal that unites us. And, and we have a partnership and a unity in that and a passion and a connection. But one day that goal is going to be gone. Maybe I won't be homeschooling my kids anymore. Um, there's lots of other things that can connect us. Uh, a friend of mine, he was in a startup. And man, that startup company, they were connected. They pulled all-nighters. They're working weekends. I mean, full of joy and passion and excitement and together for this one purpose. Well, Paul talks about the gospel being what unites us as Christians, being what unites us in God. And he says, because of your partnership in the gospel, and I think it's helpful to think, you know, why was that partnership what united them? Well, it's because that partnership in the gospel was the foundation of Paul's life. And it was the foundation of their life. So what is the foundation of your life? Is the foundation and purpose of your life pleasure? Then maybe that's the foundation of your friendships. And once that pleasure is gone, you move on. Maybe the foundation and purpose of your life is peace. When that peace is gone or when that peace is shaken, you want to run away. And that's human. That's normal. But in Christ, we're new creations. And in Christ, he gives us the power and the strength to not run away because our foundation isn't shaken. Okay, we didn't get that peace. That pleasure is gone now. But our hope is in the gospel and in God. If the foundation of your life is God and the purpose is the gospel, then even in trials, even in disappointments, your hope and, and purpose is not the other person. It's God. And so your hope and purpose is secure. It's why James tells us that we can have joy in trials because those trials and tribulations do not define us. And those trials and tribulations are making us more like Christ. And so they actually make us joyful because we're like, God, what are you doing in this? And it's why Job could fall on his face and weep and worship. Because God was his foundation when all of his children died. When everything he had passed away, his foundation was God. So what is your foundation? Is it God? Is it the gospel? See, this doesn't mean that like your whole relationship, like your foundation of our relationship is God. And so all we can do is pray together and read God's word. No, that's not what this means. <laughs> no, what this means is that it's your purpose. It's your life goal. Whether you're making bread together or whether you're going to Disney World together, your foundation is the gospel. It's going to come up. You hit hard things. You're going to talk about it. You're rejoicing. It's going to be like God is in that. Because you're secure in God, you're rejoicing with, with, a, with a faith that can't be shaken. When you're struggling, I share with you the gospel. And when, when I'm struggling, you're going to share me with me the gospel because it's the best hope that you can give me. Um, Bonhoeffer in Life Together, he says it this way. The Christian needs another Christian who speaks God's word to him. He needs him again and again. When he becomes uncertain and discouraged, he needs his brother as a bearer and proclaimer of the divine word of salvation. And I love this last part. For the Christ in his own heart is weaker than the Christ in the word of his brother. His own heart is uncertain. His brother's is sure. And how often have we gone through trials and like God just kind of shrinks. We think, what can he do? This is too much for him. We lash out in anger. We lash out in fear. But our brother, our sister in Christ, is there to remind us of our purpose, to remind us how great and big our God is, to remind us of his words and the scriptures that hold us together and hold us tight. When we can't remember them for ourselves, we need each other to remind, to remind ourselves of that truth. So the foundation is God. The purpose is the gospel. And what are the results? Point three. The result is freedom. I love verse six. Philippians chapter one, verse six. It's the next verse. It says, 
and I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say that again. He, God, who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it in Jesus Christ. Guys, this is such good news. This brings so much freedom. God's the one who began the work. He's the one who's going to complete the work. It is his work. We aren't here to fix our friends. We aren't here to fix ourselves. We're here to remind them of the gospel. We're here to remind them of who Jesus is. We're here for them to remind us of who God is and to remind us that the work he began in us, he will complete. Paul did not take this as, as, as an opportunity to take a back seat. He took it as an opportunity to actually lean in even stronger because his strength doesn't come from himself. It comes from God. Paul's trust was not in self. It was in God. How often do we remind our friends of this truth? So the result is freedom. We don't have to be the perfect friend. Jesus was the perfect friend. And he will finish the perfect work that he began in us and in our friends and in our children, and in our spouse, and in our colleagues, um, in our unbelieving neighbors. He's doing the work. He's doing the work. Guys, this brings relational freedom and security in Christ because relationship begins with God. It's restored by God. It's sustained by God. It's completed by God. See, human relationship, like apart from Christ, is all about what you can do for me or what I can do for you. It, even sacrificial love, even the most, the most sacrificial human being, apart from Christ, if they're not doing it with God as their worship, as their foundation, as their hope, as their, as their God, is idolatry. It's human idolatry. It makes loving a human the end in and of itself. Loving a human. Even if it's loving like, like I'm loving like someone who is poor and needy and I'm loving them sacrificially. If the end is human love, it's idolatry. It's the worshiping of humans rather than the worshiping of God. And it leads to bondage because it's all about what you can do for the other person or what you can do for yourself. It's an endless cycle. Every other relationship is based on you meeting my needs or me meeting your needs, but only in the Christian community is relationship built on Christ, meeting all of our needs at the cross, the cross of Jesus Christ. He met our needs. That's why we're a community. That's why we're one, because of God making us alive, giving us new life in him. See, apart from Christ, the best love that we can give to another human being is like our own love. Like we don't have Christ's love. It's just like the best love I can give to you. But in Christ, the best love that we can give to the other person is Christ's love shown on Calvary where justice and mercy embrace. He showed us that love. He gave us that love. And now we can give that divine love away. Our love alone will fail over and over again. But the perfect sacrificial forgiving, kind, patient. 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. That kind of love of Christ, it's, it's, it's love that only he can give. Our foundation is God. Our purpose is the gospel and the result is freedom. What would it look like to live in relationship with others, with God as our foundation? What would that look like? Maybe it would look like they don't have to prove themselves to me before I'm able to show them love. We didn't prove ourselves to God. I don't have to prove myself to them. I don't have to work to earn their approval. I love them freely in Christ, but not because I need something from them. I don't have to prove myself to them. Our foundation is built on God. It's built on forgiveness, on mercy, on grace. Our worship is to God, not one another. <laughs> they aren't my savior, God is. Relationship is not where I find my worth. It's not where I find my dignity. It is not where I find my ultimate joy. 
My joy is fulfilled in Christ, and the joy I get from others is a gift from God. It is not my God itself. It is a gift to be enjoyed. It is a gift that Paul shows us to be yearned for, to be treasured, to be pursued with the foundation of God, not self, and for the purpose of the gospel, not our own pleasures, but with freedom to trust in something greater than ourselves. See, Paul's joy in Philippians was in Christ. It wasn't in his circumstances. He was in prison. He was writing to a church in Philippi that had conflict. He wasn't writing to them full of joy because they were like, perfect, and like great relationships. No, I mean, there was fruit of the gospel, but it was, it was, it was a broken church because we're broken people. His joy was in Christ. It was in God. It was in the fact that he who began a good work will complete it. It's where he stood. He's why he said later in Philippians, whether I have a lot or whether I have a little, I've learned to be content. Whether in life or whether in death, my hope is Christ. So why is this important? Why am I giving this lecture on relationships? Well, we're about to dive into a semester focused on relationships. We're about to dive into some awesome books, awesome material on parenting, on evangelism, on friendships. All these relationships, right? Relationship with the unbeliever, relationship with your child, relationship with with one another. Well, I hope you know that even as believers, we can be prone to make relationships and friendships all about ourselves. I don't want us to go into this semester thinking, I'm going to make myself better. I'm going to figure out myself. I'm going to fix myself. I'm going to fix my relationships apart from God. And that's our tendency. So that's why I want to warn us that it's not just about me. It's actually bigger than that. It's deeper than that. It's richer than that. It's like stronger than that. See, Paul's example in Philippians shows that his deep affection was grounded in Christ. So so when we're tempted to make it about ourselves, we can remember God. We can remember he's our security. He's our hope. He's our foundation. Then we can step out in faith, not out of fear. Free to forgive free to hope, free to love. As I was putting this this whole talk together, many relationships came to mind that that have been broken um, in the church, outside of the church. One in particular was was a friend who I did something that hurt her. It's not intentional. Um, It's not even necessarily sinful. I think she wouldn't even say that it was a sinful thing, but, but it was hurtful to her. And she cut me off. She cut me out of her life completely. This was like a best friend. And ever since then, it's like kind of live in, in fear. Like, well, okay, that, I mean, that hurt for years. And the question in my mind of like, who's the next one who I'm going to offend? Who's going to cut me off? I lived in fear of rejection. And even in giving this talk, I was like, God was reminding me, he was healing in me, he was showing me. First of all, I can forgive that friend because I've done far worse to God and to others. Second of all, I don't have to live in fear. Not because no one's gonna do that to me. So I might have a best friend who leaves me again, who, who feels like death to me. But my foundation isn't that friend. My foundation is God. My foundation is his love for me. And so with that foundation, I can say, okay, I'm standing firm. I'm going to take a step. I'm going to be vulnerable. I'm going to put myself out there. I'm going to trust again. Not because that other person is trustworthy, because God is trustworthy. Because in the end, the hope is the gospel. And if I just stay in my little cocoon and never trust anyone with myself and I never get let anyone get close to me, how is that advancing the gospel in God's kingdom? How is that trusting in a God that's big enough, that's powerful enough? to protect me, even in a broken heart, to be my all in all, to be my hope in darkness. So let's let go. Let's let go of works-based friendships. Every other religion says to work for it, work harder for it. You better get it. Our religion says Jesus paid it all. Jesus paid it all. He paid it all for us towards God. He paid it all for us towards man. So when we sin against one another, we can freely confess and remember Jesus paid it all. We can ask for forgiveness. We can humble ourselves because we know how great our sin is towards our Savior. We know that we're going to sin against one another. We're sinners. 
We're not perfect yet. And we can show mercy and kindness and grace when others sin against us and freely approach them with love because Jesus paid it all. Our relationships go from human bondage to Christ-centered freedom. I love this quote from Bonhoeffer. He says in Life Together, when God was merciful to us, we learned to be merciful with our brethren. When we received forgiveness instead of judgment, we too were made ready to forgive our brethren. What God did to us, we then owe to others. The more we received, the more we were able to give. And the more meager our brotherly love, the less we were living by God's mercy and love. Is your love meager towards others? Maybe your love that you're receiving towards God is meager. Maybe you're you're not realizing how great a love God has for you. Look at your foundation, my friend. Where are you standing? Is your foundation in yourself or is it in God? Is your purpose anything other than the gospel? Is it just for freedom, for, for pleasure, for money, for security? It's going to fall away. Build up that wall, honey. None of that is safe. If your foundation is in God, his love is better. His love is protection. Not because you're never going to get hurt, but because he will never leave you. He was hurt. You remember? One of his disciples, one of the 12 disciples, sold him, kissed his cheek. He knows what it's like for everyone to abandon him. And yet he gave up everything for us. And now we are called to do that for our brothers, even the ones who betray us. Now, does that mean like they betrayed us? Let's just get them back into our circle? Uh, no, like um, don't be stupid. <laughs> what it means is we can still forgive them and love them. And we don't have to be afraid because Jesus is by our side. You know, Jesus was forsaken by God the Father. So we'll never be forsaken by God the Father. So with that, what does this mean? How then on this foundation, based on this hope, can we treat others? Well, I think we can treat the unbeliever with love that they do not have to earn. They do not have to fix themselves for us to love them because Christ didn't wait for us to fix ourselves before he died for us. We can trust God with the unbeliever's soul and we can love them passionately and we can tell them about the gospel and we can stand firm on the foundation of God, not afraid of them rejecting us, but just saying, this is our hope. This is our purpose. You know us, you know God. You know us, you know the gospel because that's what I'm living for. And I love you so much. Come into my house. Let me feed you. Let's hang out together. But like you're going to encounter God because that's who my foundation is. And I'm going to love you and I'm not going to judge you and make you have to change for me. I'm going to tell you about the gospel. And if God changes your life, girl, you're going to be changed. Not because of what I did, because of the work that God began in you. What does that mean for our children? It means they don't have to earn our love through obedience. It means we can love them and show them mercy and kindness and listen to them and care for them even when they hurt us. Because we've experienced God's mercy when we hated him and hurt him. What does that mean for our friends? Well, it means that our friendships don't have to feel like we're walking on a tightrope. Hope I don't fall to the left. Hope I don't fall to the right. Hope I don't mess up and fall out of love. No, we shouldn't be holding our breaths, just waiting for others' approval or not approval. And are we going to mess up and are we not? Breathe in mercy and breathe out grace. Breathe in the gospel and then breathe it over your sisters in Christ. And when you mess up, it's okay. You don't have to freak out. And when they mess up towards you, it's okay. You don't have to freak out. Talk to them about it. We, we both stand at Calvary's at the foot of the cross. And our good works and our nasty works and, and, and our sins and our, and our everything we put there. We worship God together and we forgive. So those are the areas we want to work on. Those are the areas we're going to be focusing on this semester. We're going to be focusing on loving our neighbor. We're going to offer classes in evangelism how we can be hospitable towards our unbelieving neighbors, like physical neighbors, but also neighbors like like friends, like coworkers, like 
you know, classmates? Um, how can we love them in relationship and preach the gospel to them? Uh, we're going to be loving our children, our relationship with our kids. We're going to be focusing on that and looking at classes on parenting, um, loving them through Christ, and then loving the saints through building relationship in the church and deeper friendship. So we'll have three classes offered each month. One will focus evangelism, parenting, and friendship. Uh, and this email or in a link somewhere, you can sign up and register for whichever class you'd like each month. You can do a face-to-face -face option, up to 10 people per class. So once that maxes out, we'll have a waiting list. Or you can sign in on Zoom and still participate in the class, at least hear the lecture and maybe do a little discussion with whoever else is on Zoom for that topic. Um, but I want to leave you with this. I want to leave you with this. The unity that we have is in Christ. We don't have this unity because we're perfect, because we treat each other perfectly. Um, we are sinners saved by grace. And it says they will know you by your unity in Christ. Christ died for that unity. So I want to end by reading the last couple verses of this section in Philippians. This is how Paul talks to the congregation in Philippi. This is his heart, his deep, divine, eternal connection with these people, which is what we have with each other, which is why we don't have to fear in relationships. And this is what he says. It is right for me to feel this way about you all. This is verse 7, Philippians chapter 1, verse 7. Because I hold you in my heart. For you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you with all of my affection and the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. That's what we're hoping to do in these classes. May our love abound. May we grow in our knowledge. May we grow in our discernment. Why? So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, right? Our purpose is the gospel. Our purpose is being like Christ because he bought us with a price, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ. Why? To the glory and praise of God. Oh, to the glory and praise of God. He's our foundation. He's our purpose. He's our protection. He is our life. And if he's not your life, and if your foundation is people or self, and you've built those walls, or you've just held on to whoever will be around you and will approve of you, pray and ask God to help you to let those go, to focus on God and him and being secure in him. And then in him, you can pursue others with freedom and with peace and with hope. Because the moment that that relationship causes more anxiety in your heart is the moment when you've kind of, you've shifted your foundation to a shifting, sinking sand that is the approval of others or how they think of you or how they're going to treat you. But when your approval is in God, which is a work only he can do, we have to remind ourselves of that. And we can freely love. We can freely mess up. We can freely make mistakes. We can freely rest in our introverted, extroverted, pineapple pizza loving selves <laughs> and say, God, you're everything. And we can love God and we can love our neighbor because he loved us. And he died for us. We can rest in him. God, I pray for the women of Palm Vista. I pray for the women, for the relationships in this city, in this world that we would base it on you and not ourselves, that our foundation would be strong, resting in your finished work at the cross, Lord, and in your salvation and forgiveness of our sins, and that as you make us more like you, Lord, that we would just have less and less anxiety when it comes to friendships, less and less fear driven, but a fear of God, not others, would drive us towards you and towards one another in a radical, deep, beautiful way. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, ladies, for listening to my lecture. Thank you for staying on <laughs> and hearing just this foundational message. I hope that it spurs you on to want to grow deeper in your relationship with an unbelievers, relationship with believers, relationship with your children, if you have kids, coworkers your friends. I love you so much and I hope this semester blesses you. May God bless you and have a great day. Bye.